says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will straighten your path. God, we're grateful for your guidance and for your wisdom, for how you continue to keep us, even in seasons of pandemic and seasons of challenge and seasons of uh, difficulty. God, we're grateful today for how you're with us, you lead us, and you guide us. Now, God, as we enter into this moment to hear from your word, it's our prayer that you would speak to our hearts afresh, that you would indeed prepare us to receive what it is you have to say to us today. Through your word, God, we pray that you would honor publicly the time spent privately in preparation for this moment. God, punish not your people for the frailty of your preacher. Instead, use me in spite of me so people would be edified and that you, God, would get all of the glory. It is in the mighty, the matchless, and the marvelous name of your son, Mary's baby, and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, we pray. And all God's children said amen, amen, and amen. Again, we praise God for our minister of music, for sharing, and for all who helped to make each and every week, this virtual space, a space where you can come and feel uh, the Spirit of the Lord moving in this time. For the time we have together today, I'd like for us to launch from the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse number 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Uh, you can write it down, mark it in your, uh, your Bible on your smart device, your tablet, your telephone, or turn to it in your yeah, your book Bible, the real physical Bible, whatever the case is, you can mark it there, but it'll also show up on your screen as we read together from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3 in the New International Version. The word reads as follows, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus, for in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day our Lord Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word, and we pray that it will rest on your hearts and transform your lives. Verse 7 says this, again, therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord, Jesus Christ, to be revealed. Uh, for the time we have together today, I'd like to tag this text with the topic, uh, while we wait, while we wait. As the days of the pandemic have worn on, I have been struggling, y'all, with the patience needed to wait this virus out. Don't judge me this morning, y'all. Don't judge me. I know what is the best thing for us right now. But if I can have an honest and human moment today, I'm tired of waiting for this thing to be over. Y'all, listen, I'm ready to hang out with my family and my friends, uh, ready for Sunday dinners gathered um, with great food and great fellowship and laughter. I'm, I'm ready to see each and every one of you in the building, hugging on your necks as we worship and fellowship together. I'm ready, Lord knows I'm ready, to hop on a plane with my wife and head for white beaches and clear waters. And listen, this morning, I know, I'm sure I'm not alone. 
because I believe that many of us are suffering in this season from what has become known as pandemic fatigue that comes from waiting for this particular season of coronavirus and social distancing uh, and masking and stay at home orders and quarantining to be over. Uh, but y'all, while we wait, we have to continue to do the right things. We have to continue to be smart, to wear our masks, to socially distance, and to take all of the measures and precautions during this waiting period. I know we are tired of waiting, but while we wait, we have to do the things, um, the right things to make it through this season to help keep us and those around us healthy. Uh, but this morning, I just wanted to acknowledge this reality that just because it's the right thing to do, uh, it's the right thing to wait and to be patient, doesn't mean that the waiting hasn't wearied us or worn us down. And in many ways, the weariness of waiting isn't just an outcome of the pandemic. It is part of what is wrapped in the narrative uh, of Advent and Christmas tide. Waiting is intertwined into the entire narrative of the Christmas story. While the Israelites are waiting for their exile to end in the Old Testament, God speaks through the prophet to tell the people that a day is coming for a new covenant that will be written on the hearts of God's people. In Jeremiah 31, there's seemingly centuries of silence between the close of the prophets in the Old Testament and the arrival of Christ in Matthew. The people were waiting in this time for a word from the Lord. Uh, even the lineage in Matthew chapter 1 points to a waiting period before the birth of the Messiah, as the old preachers would say, 40 and two generations from Adam to Jesus being born. Christmas and Advent, y'all, is really about managing the wait. This time of year, as we celebrate these liturgical seasons and we live in the midst of a pandemic, we are reminded that this is a season of waiting. We are commemorating the waiting that came before the birth of Christ and anticipating the return of Christ who is yet to come. And prior to Christ's coming, there was, they were waiting and hoping for the arrival of the Messiah, but most missed his coming until he was gone again. Currently, we know that Christ is coming gone and is coming back again. And what matters most for us is what we do while we wait. This notion is central to Paul's opening salutation in this letter uh, to the Corinthian church that we know as 1 Corinthians. They are reminded that they are waiting for the fullness of Christ's re uh, revelation. This is a commonality that connects the first century and the 21st century church. They, just like us, were waiting for Jesus to show up, eagerly, expectantly, and with great anticipation, looking towards the second coming of Jesus Christ. Having shared with leaders from the church and having been brought up to speed in regards to what was happening in Corinth, Paul was concerned about how the disciples were managing this waiting period. The Corinthian church, y'all, had some issues going on. They were a spiritually gifted church, but were challenged with properly utilizing their gifts in a manner that allowed them to maximize their benefits for the continued betterment of their community. Y'all, they were having relational issues and creating division because of the gifts that were supposed to unify them as believers. They were a church who was more about the promotion of themselves based on their gifts instead of lifting up the name of Christ. As was his pattern, Paul begins his letters with the pattern pattern of uh, offering thanksgiving for the commonality of grace which has saved them all and using this as a foundation he foreshadows the content of his letter in these selected verses for today we see that he is beginning with the proper uh, with the picture for of the proper disposition for disciples to have as they are waiting for Christ's return in court and according to Paul there is a right way for us to wait embedded in the text is a timeline of sorts that gives def uh, definite yet ambiguous time of awaiting. In verse 4, waiting begins at the point that God's grace was given in Jesus Christ. And it ends, according to verse, day, uh, verse 8, on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Y'all, we know the first date because that's the date when we gave Jesus control of our lives by responding to the call of salvation on our lives. But for the Corinthians and any Christian over the last 2,000 plus years, we don't have an exact date of the day of the return of the Lord. Y'all, we watch and we wait. We wait and we watch, but the promised return of Christ has not happened yet. One of the troubles with waiting is the how long factor. It's easier to wait for something or for someone when we know that there is a definitive and preferably short amount of time to wait. We can wait for things that we know are coming soon, but when that timeline is more undefined and we don't have an idea of when the thing we are waiting to happen will happen, it gets hard to maintain our focus on the event we are waiting to happen. Uh, And we try to divert our attention uh, because we get anxiety about the event. And so we divert our attention from it so that our every thought is not consumed by the possibilities of what is to come. However, Paul would suggest to us today uh, that we should be focused on that which is not yet in order to live and appropriately manage the right now. Our future focus should drive our actions in the present. We know Jesus is coming back and looking for a church without spot or wrinkle. We, uh, he's seeking those who have been redeemed by his blood, walking and practicing the newness of life by loving and telling the gospel story that others might know Jesus in the beauty of holiness. Uh, in other words, our waiting isn't passive, y'all. Our waiting should be active. Our lives should be driven and filtered through the fact that Jesus is, in fact, set to come again. And we can have confidence in the midst of our waiting, yes, waiting on Christ to come, even waiting for this pandemic to be over, that it will not be in vain because Jesus has proclaimed it and God has ordained it. So then why today does Paul suggest that we can have confidence while we are waiting? Three things this morning and I'll be out your way. First, we can have confidence while we are waiting because of the grace that God has given to us. We can have confidence while we are waiting because of the grace that God has given to us. Uh, In verse 4, Paul says that he always thanks God for them because of God's grace that has been given in Christ Jesus. The notion of grace that God has given us is one that easily excites excites us. Y'all, when we hear the word grace, we think about all of the good things that God has done for us that we don't, don't deserve. It was grace that saved us. It was grace that raised us. It's grace that has kept us. We celebrate grace, but we must consider this morning the implications and our understanding about grace. Because if we aren't careful, we can devalue God's grace and take God's grace for granted. German pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this about grace in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. Uh, He says, quote, cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. We are fighting today for costly grace. The essence of grace, we suppose, is that the account has been paid in advance, and because it has been paid, everything can be had for nothing. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow upon ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of our forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, and communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Uh, Cheap grace is grace without the cross. Cheap grace is grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. But costly grace is the cost of Jesus Christ, at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again. Such grace is costly because it calls for us to follow. And it is grace because it calls for us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It's costly because it condemns sin, and it's grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because <clears throat> because it costs God the life of his son. You ye were bought at a price, and it has cost God, what, and what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son to too dear a pi- price to pay for our lives, but delivered him up for us. Y'all, it is this statement, what has cost God much 
cannot be cheap for us that should cause us to pause and assess our disposition towards God's grace. It should remind us that not only should we take it, uh, not take it for granted, but it should transform our lives. Paul implies a similar notion in his reminders about grace in our text and specifically in verses 5 and 7 when he says that the Corinthians don't lack any spiritual gift because they have been enriched by God's grace. The notion of being enriched means that we have been made wealthy in spiritual gifts by the grace of God. And with this spiritual wealth that we have acquired through Jesus Christ, we now have a responsibility to live a certain way, to hold a particular standard, and to live in a way that sets us apart as God's called out ones. Taking God's grace uh, and living any way we desire robs grace of the transformative power it possesses. In the latter part of his letter, Around verse 15 in chapter, uh, around chapter 15, rather, in verse 10, Paul writes these words. He says, I am what I am, but by the grace of God. Paul's life had been transformed by grace. He was a persecute, he was a persecutor of the gospel, turned preacher of the gospel. He was a detractor of Christ, turned disciple of Christ. He was an enemy of the kingdom, turned emissary of the kingdom. And it happened by Paul's experience of grace on that road to Damascus and in a house on Straight Street. And y'all, if Paul's story isn't enough, you ought to look at your own life and see how grace has changed you. We used to live in lives, but live in lies, but now truth orders our steps. We used to be filled with hate, but now love drives our actions. We used to be mean and manipulative, but now we are kind and thoughtful. And it's because of the grace of God at work in our lives when we realize and recognize the power of grace that comes from our God, it changes us and causes us to live better and to love better and to be better. Even as we wait, we can be getting better because of the grace of God. Y'all, grace makes us better. Grace enhances our lives. Grace adds value to our existence through the great gifts of God. Thank you, God, for your saving, transforming, and delivering grace. You ought to type that in the comments. Thank you, God, for your grace. We can have confidence while we are waiting because of the grace that God has given us. But we can also have confidence while we are waiting because God is working among us. Paul reminds the Corinthian believers in verse 5 that they have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. By the grace of salvation, uh, through faith in Jesus Christ, believers have been enriched in every way. The sign of God's presence among the people are the spiritual gifts that are active in the community of faith. The Corinthian church had no shortage of spiritual gifts. In fact, Paul spends a whole section of the letter addressing the variety of gifts that existed as a testimony of God's work among them. Part of their issues, though, was that they thought that the gifts made some folks better than others. When in actuality, everyone's gift was important because it confirmed that God was working in all of them. And in these opening lines of the letter, Paul is admonishing the church at Corinth that they need to be more aware of the gifts that they were uh, uh, the gifts that the gifts rather were a product of God's grace and an indication that God was working in their midst. Paul uses a term in verse 6 that is translated as confirming in the text, but it really means guaranteeing. The presence of God among the people through their spiritual gifts was a guarantee of the message of Christ that had been shared and believed in by the Corinthians. Because the gifts were present, it guaranteed that the Spirit of God was working among them. You know, there's an interesting thing about waiting that I've discovered uh, is that you notice things that you would otherwise take for granted. Uh, with the pace of life in our world, it's easy to breeze by things without taking any notice of them. Uh, but I recognize this as I'm riding in the car with uh, my son Jameson in the back seat. I'm focused on the road as we're going to take him and drop him off uh, to preschool. And he starts calling out all of these things. Daddy, look at this. Daddy, look at that. Daddy, look at the octagon on the house. Daddy, look at the, look at the leaves on that tree. All of these things were things that I missed because I was focused on the road. But because he was just waiting to get to school, he was able to look around and notice all the details along the journey. 
And because uh, and we are able to do this when we are waiting, but we have a chance to take advantage of seeing things that we may have missed before. In the same manner, when we wait, uh, it should raise our awareness of the fact and the ways that God is already working among us. We should be able to notice that the things that pushed us, pushed us to act outside of our character last year don't bother us in the same way this year. We should be able to notice that the negative feelings that we had about somebody five years ago have dissipated and disappeared. We should notice that we are less hesitant to contribute to the work of the ministry with our time, talent, and treasure now. We should recognize that our first response to trouble and chaos is no longer to hit the bottle or the blunt, but to hit our knees in prayer. We should look around and recognize that we are more open to helping the greater community than we have been in the past. We should look around and see the quiet supporters of our goals, our dreams, and our visions. We should see all of the changes and all of the things that are happening around us individually and among us collectively as signs that God is at work. And when we start to recognize the signs of God shaping us and molding us and making us better, we start to in focus more intentionally on what, uh, on what and where God is working in our lives so that we can continue to grow better, stronger, and wiser uh, than before, regardless of what's happening around us. And a part of the issues for the church at Corinth was that they thought God was done working in them because of the prevalence and the presence of the gifts among the people. But what God wants them to be aware of is that God was still working in them and would continue to work among them until they reached their Christ-like maturity that wouldn't come until the day that Jesus returned. And the reality is that we should never think that God is done working on us or done working in us or done working among us because there is more. Uh, there is more work that God has to do in us and through us and among us. We haven't reached it yet. We haven't made it yet. We haven't gotten there yet because God is still working to make us into the image of God's only son, Jesus Christ. And our prayer ought to be today, God, it might be hard. God, it might be painful. God, it might make me uncomfortable, but keep working on me, God. Make me over again, God. Keep working in me, God. Keep working through me, God. Keep working among us, God, and through us so that we can be all that you desire for us to be. You ought to put it in the comments right now and say, keep working on me, God. God, keep working on me. We can have confidence while we wait because of the grace that God has given us. We can have confidence because God is working among us. But finally today, we can have confidence while we are waiting because God is faithful to us. I could probably stop right there and just close the sermon and, and, and we could get a benediction and go on about our business for the day. Uh, but God is faithful to us. Paul says this plainly in verse number nine. It says, God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We could probably stop at the first three words of this verse and talk about all the ways that God has been faithful. Paul says it quite nicely in these verses, however, that God is the start and the finish of this thing. God called us into fellowship with Jesus Christ. God gave us grace because we are connected to Christ. God gave us everything we need through the spiritual gifts that, so that we are enriched and enhanced while we wait. And in verse number eight, Paul tells us that God will keep us firm to the end so that we would be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The same Greek word that was used in verse number six, meaning to confirm or establish or guarantee, is the same word that Paul uses in describing what God will do for us in verse number eight. God will confirm. God will establish. God will guarantee us to the end. We can depend on God to see it through. This is why Paul wrote in Philippians that there has never been the slightest doubt 
in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day that Christ Jesus appears. He who began a good work in you will see it to completion. Y'all, because what I've discovered is that God isn't like people because we can start some stuff and not finish it. But if God starts it, God is going to finish it because God, y'all, is faithful. And even in the chaos of a life, God is faithful. Even when your friends walk away, God is faithful. You are never alone because God is faithful. Even in the midst of coronavirus, God is faithful. Even in the midst of political transition, God is faithful. God won't leave you hanging. God won't turn God's back on you. God won't leave you to figure it out by yourself because you can depend on God because God is faithful. Y'all, God is faithful today. God is so faithful that God was compelled to save a world that had turned its back on God because of sin. You know the text in John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, and the Bible says uh, that God sent his only son uh, as divinity wrapped in uh, humanity. Uh, a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Uh, lying in uh, a manger uh, to grow uh, and to live uh, and to love uh, and to eventually die on a cross. Uh, that whosoever would believe on him would have everlasting life. Uh, but y'all check this out. Uh, that God is so faithful uh, that even when Jesus said on the cross uh, that it uh, uh, is finished. Uh, God wasn't finished uh, because early on Sunday morning, uh, Jesus got up uh, with all power uh, in his hands uh, and was elevated to the place uh, where every knee would have to bow uh, and every tongue uh, would have to confess uh, that Jesus Christ uh, is the Lord. Uh, and if God was faithful to Jesus uh, in the midst of his crucifixion moment, uh, if God was faithful to Jesus uh, in the midst of him laying in a borrowed tomb, uh, if God was faithful to Jesus uh, and raised him from the dead, uh, uh, then God will be faithful unto you. Uh, and that's how we know uh, that we can hold on uh, uh, while we wait uh, because God is faithful. Uh, and I believe y'all uh, that that's why the songwriter wrote the song, uh, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning uh, new mercies I see uh, all I have needed thy hand hath provided. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great thy faithfulness Lord unto me uh, even while we wait uh, God is faithful uh, and if that's your testimony today uh, you ought to air high five your neighbor in your living room uh, and tell him God is faithful uh, if that's your testimony today uh, you ought to take a moment uh, and put it in the comments uh, and say God is faithful uh, if that's your testimony today uh, you ought to have confidence uh, while you wait uh, because God is faithful uh, God's given you grace. God's given you gifts. God is working among you. God is doing it right now. He's opening doors. He's providing for you. God is faithful. You just got to be faithful while you wait for God to do what God is doing. Be faithful and trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he he shall direct your path. You ought to trust him today. Put your trust in the Lord and he'll keep you. He'll preserve you. He'll make ways for you. He'll open doors for you. He'll do it for you. You just got to trust him today. Even while you wait. As we enter into this season, now two weeks into this season of Advent, now nine months into the midst of pandemic. It's about waiting. Trusting that God is right there with us. Still showing his faithfulness to us. While we wait. God is faithful. 
God is faithful. We need, you just need to look around at your life to see the ways that God has proven his faithfulness unto you. Some of us thought we were going to lose jobs and we're still working. Thought the ends weren't going to meet. But yet, we've not gone without bills still being paid. Many of us, even in a season where we've lost the loved ones, God has yet continued to hold us up in the midst of it. God's been faithful. And we ought to have confidence that God will be with us while we wait. God, we thank you for your presence and your faithfulness that when we can't count on anyone else, we know that we can count on you. God, we pray today that you would open up the eyes of our hearts to see where you are yet working among us, to see where you are yet faithful to us. God, and to live out of place of gratitude as we wait for things to change and to shift and to move in our lives, God. Not, not just in this moment of pandemic, God, but there's some of us that are waiting for some other stuff to happen and take place. Things with jobs and things with relationships and things even with our, uh, our own personal growth and development. God, we're asking you now, open the eyes of our hearts that we can look around and see why we can trust you and have confidence in you while we wait. Now, God, we pray today that as you open the eyes of our hearts towards your faithfulness, God, that you open someone's heart to be receptive to connecting with, your, with you in relationship through your son, Jesus Christ. Whoever's watching this, some man, woman, boy, or girl, that they would make the decision now to say yes to your will, yes to your way. Yes, they'll trust you, and yes, they'll obey. We thank you, Lord, and we honor you. It's in the mighty and the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's children said amen.